All right, over the past few weeks, we've been covering our second unit on racisms. And I have an S at the end to emphasize that there are multiple types of racisms. And we need to understand that they are all different. Often people understand racism to be interpersonal, meaning a one-on-one -on -one or face-to-face -face negative interaction where one person who hates the other person because of their skin color does something or says something racist to that person. However, as we've learned from both of the readings from Lipsitz and Bonilla Silva, as well as earlier readings from Omi and Wanat and Ian Haney Lopez, we need to move past this rudimentary idea to instead understand racism as systemic, as institutional, as structural. In other words, rather than an individual prejudice, racism is actually so much more. Racism is embedded in and through the institutions of our society, including housing, education, healthcare, and the criminal legal system. And in Lipsitz's work, he focuses on housing to demonstrate the ways that racism figuratively and literally takes place. So let's get started with Lipsitz. So I know that the Lipsitz reading was a bit dense and the first half of the chapter is a bit more difficult than the second half. However, this is an important reading that does quite a lot of work. And while it's not written in a way that gives us concrete nuggets or concepts, um, when we unpack Lipsitz's work, uh, we can get his main claims. So first, before we get to the idea of the white spatial imaginary, which was the title of this chapter from Lipsitz's book, Lipsitz's book, How Racism Takes Place, let's first define what scholars mean when we use the term whiteness. So whiteness as a phenomenon is not the same as white people, but of course, a white racial identity is linked to the overall idea of whiteness. Uh, that being said, white people are not the only ones who participate in whiteness, although they are its primary beneficiaries. So critical whiteness studies is an academic field of study, and many scholars from various fields study it in different ways, from sociologists, psychologists, communication scholars, American studies scholars, and of course, ethnic studies scholars. And if you're interested in learning more on this topic, I recommend looking up work from Nell Irvin Painter, Ruth Frankenberg, Richard Dyer, Robin D'Angelo, David Rodiger, and of course, W.E.B. Du Bois. So in all of these amazing scholars refer to whiteness, they are generally referring to a racialized system of power that privileges bodies, practices, and behaviors associated with white racial identity that is bolstered by the masking of its own operations. Meaning that whiteness is so powerful exactly because it is largely invisible. It is so taken for granted and embedded in our everyday realities as normal or just the way things are that most of the time we don't even notice it. And worse, if and when we do notice it and say something, we're often told that we ourselves are the problem. As Lipsitz notes, quote, racialized space enables the advocates of expressly racist policies to disavow any racial intent. They speak on behalf of whiteness and its accumulated privileges and immunities, but rather than having to speak as whites, they present themselves as racially unmarked homeowners, citizens, and taxpayers whose preferred policies just happen to sustain white privilege and power. One of the privileges of whiteness, as Richard Dyer reminds us, is never having to speak its name." Unquote. And that's page 35. So Lipsitz also argues that condemning whiteness is not the same as condemning white people. He says, Quote, whiteness is a structured advantage subsidized by segregation. It is not so much a color as a condition. Yet because whiteness rarely speaks its names or admits to its advantages, it requires the construction of a devalued and even demonized blackness to be credible and legitimate. Although the white spatial imaginary originates mainly in appeals to the financial interests of whites rather than to simple fears of otherness, over time, it produces a fearful relationship to the specter of blackness. The possessive investment in whiteness guarantees whites that the not free is not me. And that's page 37. So that's how systems of domination and superiority work. To be on top, someone has to be on the bottom. 
Now, some people can become defensive upon learning about whiteness and white privilege. They might say, slavery was a long time ago, or I grew up and I had to struggle, so how can you say that I ever had any privileges? To that, whiteness scholars would say that white privilege does not mean that you never had obstacles in your life. White privilege is not having your skin color be one of those obstacles. For more on the types of deflections that white folks sometimes make in regard to race, racism, and white privilege, stay tuned for our discussion on the article by Bonilla Silva in the second half of this lecture. For now, though, let's just plow ahead and get to the next major important point from Lipsitz, the white spatial imaginary. So the white spatial imaginary is pretty central to Lipsitz's chapter. Lipsitz argues that the white spatial imaginary is a homogenous space that values sameness, purity, order, and control. It doesn't like others or outsiders, and it surveils and polices anyone who seems to not belong. It takes the shape of suburbs, for example, which are often gated with homeowners as associations that control how long your grass is, what color you paint your house, and how much tax revenue gets funneled into nearby schools. Now, in addition to being literal, a literal physical space, uh, the white spatial imaginary is also an imaginary place, right? It's an imaginary place because it imagines that it is safe from the social ills and vices of quote unquote urban spaces. In fact, it thinks of itself as the opposite of urban spaces. So the people who live in these spaces in the white spatial imaginary, imagine that in their neighborhood, there are no drugs, no druggies, no people experiencing homelessness, no criminal or illicit activity, no sexual deviance, no toxic waste or pollution, and certainly no poor people. Because of the imagined superiority of white racialized space, the people that dwell in these spaces feel that they are in some way morally superior to those who cannot afford to be there. Or worse, instead of acknowledging the various and numerous barriers to equal housing, such as systemic discrimination, redlining, gerrymandering, and more, these people simply say, well, if black and brown people wanna live in this type of neighborhood, they should just move here. As if it were that simple. As if communities of color live in impoverished areas by choice. And as Lipset says, quote, the white spatial imaginary has cultural as well as social consequences. It structures feelings as well as social institutions. The white spatial imaginary idealizes pure and homogenous spaces, controlled environments, and predictable patterns of design and behavior. It seeks to hide social problems rather than solve them. The white spatial imaginary promotes the quest for individual escape rather than encouraging democratic deliberations about the social problems and contradictory social relations that affect us all. The suburb is not only an engine of self-interest, but also a place that has come to be imbued with a particular moral value consistent with deeply rooted historical ideals and illusions." End quote, page 29. And, and before I move on, homogenous or homogeneity uh, is an important term here that I haven't yet explained. So homogenous basically means the same, whereas heterogeneous means different. So a homogenous space means everybody there is the same. They might all look the same or have the same ideals, the same politics, the same privileges, uh, the same income sources, and things of that nature. And that is why this white spatial imaginary uh, is said to uh, sort of value that, that homogeneity because it values sameness. It doesn't like others. It doesn't like outsiders, people who don't belong. So importantly, Lipsitz argues, quote, the privileged moral geography of the properly ordered, prosperous private dwelling depends upon systematic exclusion. Once again, for a space to be homogenous and exclusive, it has to imagine non-desirables, others who do not belong. So the classic and tragic example would be the young Trayvon Martin, who was killed by an off-duty police officer who saw this young man walking around in a gated neighborhood, wearing a hoodie and eating candy and deciding, no, that type of person does not belong. So though you know Trayvon was not committing any crime, he lost his life 
And Lipsitz would argue that he lost his life in large part to the white spatial imaginary, a racist project, a la Omi and Wanat, that seeks to exclude others in order to protect an illusion of safety and sameness. Of course, Lipsitz debunks this illusion, going into detail about how discriminatory housing practices and segregation create the problems that white suburban communities complain about, such as poverty, concentrated areas of crime, hyper surveillance, drug use, mass incarceration, and more. You can see pages 36 through 40 from the Lipsitz chapter for more on that topic. In addition, our final unit of the semester will cover the injustices of our criminal legal system. So lastly, Lipsitz demonstrates that racism is systemic, that racism is not individual, right? Racist policies and practices are usually not put in place by horrible racist individuals who just hate people of color because of the color of their skin. Racist policies and practices are upheld through racist laws that span generations and are perpetuated by those who continue to benefit from those same laws even if those individuals are not themselves racist. In other words, racism is not simply individual prejudice. As Lipsitz explains, quote, by placing the emphasis on prejudice rather than on power, we lose the ability to see how race does its work in our society, how it systematically skews opportunities and life chances along racial lines, how it literally as well as figuratively takes place he goes on to say the prejudice model presumes that racism entails isolated acts by aberrant individuals motivated by hatreds they cannot control. Although racist individuals have long existed and many more of them than we like to admit remain among us today, race has not become an issue in American law or social policy because some people dislike others because of their color. Whether we like each other or not, racism does its deadly work because it makes the lives and property of some people worth more than the lives and property of others. Racism is not incidental, aberrant, or individual, but rather collective, cumulative, and continuing. It is not simply a behavior that leaves people with hurt feelings. It is, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore argues, the state, the state sanctioned and or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. So Lipsitz takes a similar approach to Omi and Wanat and Ian Haney Lopez and his approach to racism. For all of these scholars, racism is systemic, is institutional, is systematic rather than individual. And if you read this chapter carefully, Lipsitz thoroughly demonstrates that the law bends depending on the context. Just like Ian Haney Lopez illustrated, the law is not universal. It applies itself differently depending on how it can uphold whiteness and white supremacy. This is why we say that racism is systemic or systematic or institutional. All of these terms mean similar things. What they're trying to do is instead of, instead of continue to mask racism, we are using these terms to unmask it, to show how it is literally embedded in and through systems, institutions, or structures, the building blocks of our society. So now let's move on to Bonilla Silva. So what does ideology mean? So before we get we start getting into the Bonilla Silva reading, it's important that I, I cover this concept of ideology because this is a term that will come up throughout all of the readings. And it's a term that is foundational to Bonilla Silva's argument about colorblindness. Because for Bonilla Silva, colorblindness is an ideology. And without a racial ideology, Bonilla Silva argues that a racist social system, a racist structure could not even exist in the first place. So let's answer this question. What does ideology mean? So an ideology is a system slash pattern of beliefs, values, assumptions, norms, and expectations shared by a group. Um, and let's just unpack the italicized words here. So pattern, system right? This means that it's something that develops over time. It's not random. And you'll hear me say system, systemic, structure. So similarly, an ideology is, is also a system. It's a pattern. It's not random. 
beliefs and values. So these are what we, un- these are the things that we understand to be good, bad, right, wrong, right? It implies that there are multiple possible and even oppositional beliefs and values. One person might believe something is right. Another person might believe that that thing is wrong. So ideologies are things that are, that help us. They are systems and patterns that help us to understand what our beliefs are, what our values are. What do we believe in? What do we value, right? Now, assumptions and norms. This is is what we take for granted as true or just the way things are, right? Oftentimes there are things in our society that occur and we don't ever bother to question them. We don't even, we might not even know that they're there, right? Like whiteness, for example, as a phenomenon. It isn't until we call it out, we learn about it, we expose it. We call it by its name that we then can unpack how it is continuing to be pervasive throughout our society, how we all participate in it, how some benefit from it and others not. So lastly, here we have expectations. Expectations means how, sh- how we should think or act or behave in particular contexts. So ideology is like a lens that focuses our perceptions and shapes how we see the world and the people in it, including ourselves. Ideologies shape the way we perceive the world, right? So what, is some, what are some examples of ideologies then? Well, religion is certainly one, right? Religion is a system or pattern of beliefs, values, assumptions, norms, and expectations shared by a group. So Christianity, for example, Christians have a particular system and pattern of of beliefs. That's an ideology. Same thing goes with um, Islam and Muslims. Uh, Patriotism is also an ideology. Nationalism, conservatism, liberalism, consumerism, socialism, capitalism, vegetarianism or veganism, patriarchy, feminism, even racism and anti-racism. So as you can see, lots of isms, right? And each of these ideologies has under its umbrella a system of beliefs, values, assumptions, norms, and expectations that help to support it. Take patriotism. Some things that fall under the umbrella of patriotism in the United States are the belief that citizens and residents of the U.S. should be devoted to and should actively support the interests of that country, valuing the country's defining symbols, such as the flag and the national anthem the norm of participating in national rituals, such as pledging allegiance to the flag, singing the national anthem, the expectation that people should stand and maybe even remove their hats when doing these things, and the assumption that speaking against these symbols or the country that they represent when injustices are committed is equivalent to being unpatriotic or anti-American. So this is how ideology operates right, as a system and as a pattern. So now that we know what ideology is, let's move on to the key concepts from the Bonilla Silva reading. All right, so for Bonilla Silva in particular, without racial ideology or racism, um, he says Europeans could not have conquered, enslaved, and exploited people based on the claim that some people are different, better than others. So that's page uh, 1361. So therefore, for Bonilla Silva, racial ideology is the foundation of racism. He says, the prejudice of individuals is not and can never be the basis for maintaining racial inequality. Without an ideology to justify and enable racial projects, racial domination would not be possible at all. So like every scholar that we've read and engaged with so far, Bonilla Silva argues that racism cannot be understood as simply individual prejudices, but instead should be understood as institutional, systemic, or in his words, structural. So let's examine how he conceptualizes race and racism to better understand what he means by structural. All right, so here we have race. So for Bonilla Bonilla Silva, race is certainly a social construction and not biological, but even more importantly, race is both material and ideological, meaning that while the idea of race is an ideological construction, it is also, quote, socially real, 
In other words, one's race is real in that there are real world consequences for being seen or understood as a particular race versus another. Yes, race is a social, social construction, but being perceived as black in our US American society versus white, two totally different life experiences. Like Ian Haney Lopez, Bonilla Silva argues that race is closely tied to group membership and by extension to personal identity. He says, quote, after the process of attaching a meaning to a people is instituted, race becomes a real category of group association and identity. He also says that as each racial group experiences similar circumstances, a sense of us versus them is formed, essentially pitting racial groups against one another. And this is also similar to Omin Winat, who say that race is a way of making up people. So here Bonilla Silva says, right, quote, racism produced and continues to produce races out of peoples who were not so before. So on that note, let's discuss Bonilla Silva's understanding of racism. So according to Bonilla Silva, quote, racism is a product of racial domination projects e.g. colonialism, slavery, labor, migration, etc. And once this form of social organization emerged in human history, it became embedded in societies. He goes on to say, quote, racism is above anything about practices and behaviors that produce a racial structure, a network of social relations at social, political, economic, and ideological levels that shape the life chances of the various races. Thus, racism as a form of social organization places subjects in common social locations. As subjects face similar experiences, they develop a consciousness, a sense of us versus them. So Bonilla Silva wants us to take his approach to racism, which he calls the racialized social system approach, in which economic, political, social, and ideological levels are partially structured by the placement of actors in racial categories or races. And those are his words. So this means that a racial ideology is embedded in and perpetuated through every structure of our society, be it economic, political, social, or otherwise. And this approach completely turns away from the idea that racism is simply found in bigoted individuals. And instead it focuses on revealing how racism endures through the very structures that hold up our society's institutions. Now, Bonilla Silva's main argument in this reading is that in the post-civil rights era, racism is no longer found in overt Jim Crow-like events, but rather through a colorblind ideology. And he explains, quote, by this colorblind ideology, I mean the system or racial structure characteristic of the post-civil rights era comprised of the following elements. One, the increasingly covert nature of racial discourse and practices. Two, the avoidance of direct racial terminology. Three, the elaboration of racial political agenda that eschews direct racial references. Four, the subtle character of most mechanisms to reproduce racial privilege. And five, the rearticulation of some racial practices of the past end quote, and that's page 1362. So that's a lot of things going on there, right? And we're going to unpack those um, in a minute. But he does go on to say that, quote, these practices illustrate a new style of discrimination because all of them are hard to detect and even harder to label racial, end quote, and that's page 1362. So his main argument here is that this new racism, this colorblind um, ideology is subtle, it is covert rather than overt. It hides behind explanations and justifications that seem totally non-racialized in order to perpetuate racist ideas, beliefs, attitudes, norms, practices, and behaviors. Bonilla Silva says, quote, racial inequality is still produced in a systematic way, i.e., which means in other words, there is still a racial structure in America but the dominant practices that produce it are no longer overt. They seem almost invisible and are seemingly non-racial, end quote. So in the next slide, which is also the last slide for this lecture, 
I'm going to more thoroughly unpack Bonilla Silva's conceptualization of her colorblind ideology. Okay, so according to Bonilla Silva, there are three central elements to a colorblind ideology. One is frames, two, style, and three, racial stories. So let's unpack each of these elements briefly. So first we have frames. Bonilla Silva says that frames are the dominant themes of colorblindness. He says the main themes are a minimization of racism, cultural racism, naturalization, and abstract liberalism. And in particular, he says that, quote, abstract liberalism is the core frame of this ideology and incorporates the notion of liberalism in an abstract and decontextualized manner. By employing this frame, whites appear reasonable and moral while opposing all kinds of interventions to deal with racial inequality. That's page 1364. So by liberalism, Bonilla Silva does not mean liberal politics or liberal politicians um, like Kamala Harris or you know, President Biden. He means liberalism as in the main tenets that we believe in as a country, such as equality, freedom, and liberty for all. So in a colorblind ideology, these central liberal American ideals are used in abstract ways that allow uh, the person using such language to appear reasonable. So for example, they can say, well, I believe in justice for, and liberty for all, but I don't support affirmative action because it hurts white people's chances of getting into college. So you can see here that by first appealing to liberalism in an abstract way, in other words, just saying like, oh, I believe in equality, but yet not understanding or explaining equality and what that means, this person is still able to oppose a law meant to equal the playing field across all racial groups without sounding explicitly racist, right? So they're able to talk about how they don't believe in something that is actually at its core about liberty, equality, and freedom for all as it is correcting an imbalance in order to, in order to produce equality and or in order to level the playing field for all peoples. And yet, even though that is exactly what this country is about, our liberal ideals of equality, freedom, justice, liberty, this person is able to just use it in an abstract way and then actually oppose the very things that they say that they value or believe in. So this brings us to the next element of colorblindness, which focuses on the types of language and word choices used within this type of ideology, which is style. So for Bonilla Silva, style is the quote, peculiar linguistic manners and rhetorical strategies or race talk of this ideology. And that's page uh, 1365. So he says, quote, the stylistic components of a colorblind racism showcase the slippery and often subtle language of the post-civil rights era. Whites avoid direct racist language to express their racial views, employ semantic moves to avoid discussions and project their own views to implicate the minority party. And that's page 1365. So he may sound a little harsh here, but he does demonstrate exactly what he means by including snippets from his research in which he interviewed white folks about race. He says that the most prevalent semantic moves are when white folks say, quote, I'm not racist and some of my best friends are black. And Bonilla Silva says that people use these phrases as rhetorical shields that protect them from being labeled as racist, yet it still allows them to say racist things. So this is how words that are sort of evasive, in other words, they are kind of avoiding outrightly, uh, outright language that indicates race, and yet these words and, and rhetorical strategies are explicitly about race, right? It's this very interesting balance here. And that's why he says that they, it's peculiar. There is particular linguistic manners and particular uh, slippery rhetorical strategies, right? It's subtle. It's this very strategic maneuver. It's the ability to say, look, I have a black friend. So I can say, that black people abuse X or Y system. So you can see how that's an incredibly racist thing to say, yet by using that style, right? That linguistic sort of rhetorical strategy, 
you can't necessarily label that person a racist because they said, well, they have black friends. And so the last element of a colorblind ideology, according to Bonilla Silva, is racial stories, which is similar. Uh, but racial stories, according to Bonilla Silva, quote, provide a platform for whites to narrate their views and experiences on race. These narratives are ideological because they are collective. They're social representations. Um, and that again, that's page 1365. So Bonilla Silva says that there are three main types of racial stories. One are storylines, two are testimonies, and three are residual. And here we're just gonna focus on storylines. So storylines are socially shared tales that are fable-like and incorporate a common scheme. And Bonilla Silva says that the dominant storylines of colorblind racism are, quote, the past is the past. I did not own any slaves. If Jews, Irish, and Italians made it, how come Blacks have not? And I did not get a job or a promotion or was not admitted to college because of a Black man. So I don't know about you all, but these storylines are very familiar to me. I have heard each of these a million times. According to Bonilla Silva, quote, these stories reflect people's attempts to rationalize the racial order with material from their own lives. Page 1365. So in other words, people try to justify the unjust, unequal racial structure of our society by making it about themselves. Hey, my dad struggled and he made it. Why can't you? But once again, people tend to understand racism as individual, as if one need only choose to succeed instead of choosing to fail. As Bonilla Silva argues, quote, racial rule is no longer accomplished in brutal, overt fashion. Yet racial rule remains in place through smiling discrimination and institutionalized, seemingly non-racial practices that maintain racial inequality. It's page 1369. So Bonilla Silva and Lipsitz, like Omin Wanan and Ian Haney Lopez, all share similar ideas about race and racism, and importantly, provide us with the knowledge and language to describe what is often indescribable, how race and racism take place in our society. And despite shifting attitudes and societal progress at large, they help us to understand how racism continues to exist and persist.